On a lighter note, um, what a testimony to the unity of the body of Christ that a Sooner fan who did not go to Oklahoma asked the opening prayer, and now a Longhorn fan who did not go to the University of Texas feebly attempts to teach you this morning. Thank you, Seth. We got a lot of, Cindy said that on, in the car, well, there's a lot of happy people out there. I said, yeah, more, even more so. We used to have some Alabama fans here in our church, uh, but we have a lot of Aggies uh, still. They're not here. How do you explain that? But I think I have an explanation. We saw some uh, photos on Instagram this morning, but We'll turn in your Bibles to the fourth chapter of the Gospel of Luke. We're going to, Lord willing, finish the fourth chapter of Luke's Gospel today. As a reminder, it began with uh, Jesus' temptation in the wilderness and his defeat of the devil. And then in our last lesson, he returned to Nazareth, his hometown, and his experience there Uh, gave him a taste of the kind of rejection that he could expect during his uh, public ministry. And now today we find him engaged in a very busy day in the town of Capernaum. So let's begin reading in verse 31. And he came down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath. And they were amazed at his teaching, for his message was with authority. In the synagogue, there was a man possessed by the spirit of an unclean demon. And he cried out with a loud voice, let us alone. What business do we have with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him down in the midst of the people, he came out of him without doing him any harm. And amazement came upon them all, and they began talking with one another, saying, What is this message? For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. And the report about him was spreading into every locality in the surrounding district. Then he got up and left the synagogue and entered Simon's home. Now Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever, and they asked him to help her. And standing over her, he rebuked the fever, and it left her, and she immediately got up and waited on them. And while the sun was setting, all those who had any who were sick with various diseases brought them to him, and laying his hands on each one of them, he was healing them. Demons also were coming out of many, shouting, You are the Son of God, but rebuking them, he would not allow them to speak, because they knew him to be the Christ. When day came, Jesus left and went to a secluded place, and the crowds were searching for him and came to him and tried to keep him from going away from them. But he said to them, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also, for I was sent for this purpose. So he kept on preaching in the synagogues of Judea. Well, I'm sure you noticed, I hope you did, the the emphasis that Jesus placed or that Luke placed on the authority intrinsic in our Lord. I've titled our lesson, if you have an outline, A Busy Day at Capernaum. It might have been better, perhaps, to have called it The Amazing Authority of Jesus. A sense of authority is an elusive thing. Uh, Many of us have felt at one time or another the frustration that comes from feeling we have none 
Uh, consequently, we try to conjure up some measure of authority to put on display. The problem typically is that people don't buy it. It's like the colleague or teammate who aspires to be uh, the leader, the only problem being nobody wants to follow them. Now, to some, authority comes naturally. The confidence of competence and courage of having knowledge in one's own possession that lends certainty and conviction. When I was in seminary, and perhaps it's still true today, there was a popular sentiment frequently expressed about one's experience there. When I was in seminary, this was a sentiment uh, that uh, tended to hold true. Uh, but the accepted wisdom was that in your first year there, okay, let's let them get seated. In your first year, when I was at seminary, we had this popular uh, sentiment, and uh, it went like this. In your first year at seminary, you typically don't know you don't know. In the second year, you know you don't know. In the third year, you don't know you know. And then in the fourth year, you know you know. Well, looking back, that was a, a tad pretentious, uh, though it did correspond with a certain reality. But the larger reality is that as long as we remain in this mortal flesh, uh, in this life, we will see everything only through a mirror dimly, so to speak, and have no claim to much authority at all. Only one man has walked the earth possessing every quality necessary to true authority. It flows irresistibly out of the majesty of his person. This is the man that Paul, the Apostle Paul wrote of in Colossians 1 verse 16, that by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. It was, the, it was God the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and that's authority, that's authority. And in these verses in Luke chapter four, uh, Luke highlights that. Jesus has the authority to, to teach, uh, to exorcise demons, to heal, and to bring the kingdom of God to all who would follow him. But first we see it in his teaching ministry. Luke tells us in verse 31 that he had come down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee. That was literally true. Capernaum uh, was a city situated on the coastline of the Sea of Galilee, some 600 plus feet below the level of the Mediterranean Sea. And for the benefit, remember, of Luke's Gentile readers, he identifies the city as a city of Galilee. It would actually come to be known as Jesus' own city, Matthew 9, verse 1. He would spend a good amount of time there. Today, if you uh, go to that area in Israel, you can visit the location and view, some of you have done this, view the remains of a second or third century synagogue under which excavation suggests you find remains of this synagogue where Jesus taught. But the most important thing, uh, surely, that Luke wishes to convey is that there he was engaged in the very same thing that had occupied him in Nazareth. He was in the synagogue teaching. It was the Sabbath, and verse 32 gives us the reaction of the people to his teaching. They were amazed. Uh, the word literally suggesting that they were somehow struck out of themselves. They were agog and, and dumbfounded at what they had heard as, as if it was something that they had never experienced before in their lives. 
It may have had something to do with their knowledge of him, that he was a mere carpenter from uh, Nazareth who had not been trained in the rabbinic halls. But Luke explains the real source of their amazement. It was that his word came with such authority. Uh, Mark put it another way. In, in the lesson, I'm going to be frequently going back and forth between Luke and Mark. But Mark put it another way in his gospel. He taught them, Mark wrote, as one who had authority and not as the scribes. Originality uh, was not something that was uh, highly valued by the rabbis and the scribes. Uh, evidence of their scholarly merit was to be found instead in how many different preceding scribes and authorities they could quote. And so their lessons were filled, there's something like me, their <laughs> lessons were filled with uh, uh, quotations such as that, such and such said in such and such a work. Well, Jesus had no need for such pretension and the authority with which he spoke was shocking. Uh, you remember from the Sermon on the Mount, uh, how Jesus addressed his listeners there. You have heard that it's been said, but I say to you, Jesus drew truth from the very depths of his inner being. And consequently, it was unique. Uh, they had heard many teachers before in the synagogue, but no one had ever spoken as Jesus spoke. And my translation of verse 32 is his message was with authority, but you can see in your margin, I think, that Luke literally says his word was with authority. His word was almost supernatural. But then something else happened that increased their astonishment. There was a man in the synagogue, Luke reports, possessed by the spirit of an unclean demon. And he began disturbing everyone there by crying out with a loud voice. Now, this is our first encounter with demon possession in our study of the Gospel of uh, Luke. Uh, granted, uh, Jesus had met up with the devil himself uh, just before this, but that was an almost anticlimactic meeting looking back because the reality is the devil never really had a chance. But the Gospels and Luke's parallel book of Acts present us with instances of actual demon possession that involve very serious and real consequences to the persons involved. They are threatened with harm, both physical and psychological. And such oppression could continue for long periods of time. You know this from your study of the Gospels. Uh, without relief, uh, seemingly impervious to the best efforts to intervene. It won't do to suggest that we're dealing with the naivete of a primitive age in which any sickness or behavior that could not be explained was a, attributed to demons, whereas today we would find physiological diagnoses. No, the, the New Testament identifies sicknesses as uh, sicknesses. Uh, while also indicating that distinct and evil beings foreign to the persons possessed sometimes took control of those persons. Why that seemed to be more common in Jesus' day and far less so today, we can only surmise, and I won't take time to do that, but when we encounter such demon possession in the scriptures, we must accept it uh, for what it was, a, a quite serious and dangerous situation that caused misery to those afflicted by it, and, and a situation that our Lord was clearly equipped to alleviate. Well, the demon recognized uh, Jesus. Let us alone, he shouted at him. Let us alone. What 
business do we have with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? A little Hebrew idiom there that has, that reads something like, what is there between you and us? Nothing. There is nothing between you and us. Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But that the demons know who Jesus is is transparent in the Gospels. They have a level of knowledge about him. Well, Dan has been teaching through the epistle of James. Uh, and in the second chapter where James argues for a faith that works and, and against a, a mere profession of belief that's empty and, and without fruit, James challenges them. You remember, it wasn't that long ago. He says, you believe that God is one, you do well. The, the demons also believe and shudder. They know the truth, but they reject it. Their allegiance is with Satan. Their destiny is set, and they can only oppose Jesus. And James's point is that their knowledge and their belief are that of enemies. Uh, here, the Son of God has come into their world, uh, bringing with him a, a very provocative message. We see it a few verses down in verse 43. This is his message. It's the good news of the kingdom of God. So Jesus is on the offensive, attacking the forces of evil. As one of the commentators put it, a holy war is being launched and the demons are not unaware of it. Their knowledge is accurate. In some ways, they're advanced in their knowledge of him beyond the ordinary man or woman. You know, in the Gospels, people approach Jesus and they call him respectfully, dear sir, good rabbi, even master. But invariably, the demons describe him or address him in more exalted terms as here. He's the Holy One of God. Uh, he is later the Son of God. He's the son of the most high God. Luke's described the demon as being unclean, an interesting description. He's an unclean demon, and that he now addresses the Lord as the holy one of God, reinforces his own awareness of the vast difference of his uncleanliness and of this holy man, this holy son of God who's standing before him. It may also indicate a misguided belief that by calling him by his name, he could somehow fend off Jesus' authority over him. For you recall, it was widely accepted in these ancient days that for someone to know your name, that indicated some kind of mastery that they had over you. But Jesus would have none of it, and he quickly rebuked the demon, be quiet and come out of him. And the result in verse 35 is the demon's last spiteful surrender, throwing the possessed man down on the ground as he obediently came out. Uh, Luke then, Luke ever the Phoenician physician, noting for his readers, unlike Mark did in his gospel, that the man was not just free, he was also unharmed. That was the doctor's verdict. It was a preview of the ultimate outcome of the more prolonged conflict between God and Satan. It is God, our God, who rules the demons, not the other way around. Jesus is Lord. Why God allowed Satan this limited power for a time and reportedly still does in some parts of the world, uh, in isolated cases, I'm not sure we can say, but what we can say is that the outcome is preordained. And in due time, his final victory will be won with the same emphatic dismissal as we see here in our passage. We can also say, also say this, uh, as we think about ourselves and our own Christian walk, 
uh, that this is a conflict uh, that must take place and will always take place if, if it's true that the machinations of Satan today did not involve so much this kind of demonic possession, it doesn't follow that he is not equally active and as energetically opposed to Christ and God's kingdom. He must oppose the gospel. And we can be sure uh, that whenever and wherever the gospel ministry is being effectively set Forth, whether it's in a church uh, such as ours uh, or in our own individual lives and ministries, Satan is scheming and he is acting to undermine and impede it. He does it through our flesh, through temptation to sin. He does it through false doctrine. We know that. We talk about that a lot. Through distraction to worldliness and selfish pleasure. He does it through difficulty and disappointment like we've heard about this morning. And as we often say, if you haven't noticed him opposing you in any particular way, you might need to consider whether you're doing anything that would give him reason to oppose you. But we should also say this, and this is important. Satan can only do to us what God allows him to do. The Bible gives us examples of that, and Job is the most obvious, uh, perhaps. God gave permission to Satan to oppress Job in very severe ways, and with God's help, Job emerged victorious. At another time, Jesus told Peter, this was at the Last Supper, he said, uh, Satan had gotten permission from him to sift you like wheat. But Jesus told him he had prayed for him and indicated that though he might stumble, which he did, yet he would come back from his failure and strengthen the others. Satan uh, belongs to God, just as all creation belongs to God, and he acts only according to the sufferance of God. Even the devil is the Lord's devil. You know who said that, Luther. He can do nothing to us that our loving and merciful God does not allow him to do. And that's illustrated here in our account this morning. This demon had taken over this poor man, a terrible thing. But when Jesus entered the synagogue, he knew that that meant trouble for him. And when Jesus cut him off while he was still speaking with the direct command that he shut his mouth and come out of the man he was possessing, he could do nothing but obey. And at that, the incident really reaches its climax when the people see that kind of authority wielded by the Lord Luke repeats in verse 36 what he has already said, that they were amazed, but then adds the question that was on all of their lips, what is this? What is this word? For with authority and power, he commands the unclean spirits and they come out. This was not magic. Uh, Jesus hadn't pulled anything out of a hat or waved a wand or performed some smoke and mirrors trick. He had simply spoken the bare word, our Savior, the second person of the Trinity, God incarnate, had spoken a bare human word with divine power, and this intractable demon had immediately obeyed. There was no other option for him. No other option for him. And today... Uh, the Lord is still actively and powerfully binding Satan, and he is doing it through his body, through the church. His authority is still complete and pervasive. Uh, Luke is emphasizing that here. As I said at the beginning, Jesus has the authority to teach, to cast out demons, and as we see now in the remainder of the ch uh, chapter, uh, to lovingly heal. The Sabbaths, 
uh, synagogue meeting was brought to a close. It was customary for families to then depart and to go to their homes for the Sabbath meal. We have our own routines, don't we? On Sundays, they had their routines. And we know from Mark's gospel that Jesus went with Simon Peter and his brother Andrew and James and John, the sons of Zebedee, to the home of Peter's uh, mother-in-law. Uh, Luke, is the flow of the, of the book, Luke hasn't yet introduced us to these uh, men. Uh, that's just the way he wrote it. And he doesn't want to interrupt his flow here. He's got other things he wants to emphasize, so he doesn't introduce them to us now, but he's about to in the, in the very next chapter. And so he omits that detail. Simon's mother-in-law had come down with something and it was very sick. Uh, the other synoptic gospels mention her fever, but only our physician author Luke adds the detail. It was a high fever. So Peter was married. You don't gain a mother-in-law without gaining a spouse, typically. The Apostle Paul, too, would later remark on that fact in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, defending his own apostleship and even his own right to marry if he chose, and citing Peter's and the other apostles' marriages as a right they had, which he had forgone. The first pope was married. I don't think he's the pope, but... <laughs> And anyway, that's not the relevant thing here. The relevant thing is the concern that Jesus had for this woman, the kind of concern for women that he would put on display consistently in his ministry. But not just that. It was the power and authority he wielded in the circumstance. Jesus, or Simon's mother-in-law was desperately ill, overcome with this high fever, the effect of it was to incapacitate her. Uh, this burning hot skin uh, resulting in profuse sweating and extreme fatigue had relegated her to the sidelines, a place she was clearly not accustomed to as the story unfolds. And so it was only natural that the entourage, uh, having just witnessed uh, the miraculous in the synagogue would turn immediately to Jesus for help. And Jesus doesn't hesitate. He inserts himself directly into the circumstance. Matthew uh, tells us he touched her hand. Uh, Mark, he raised her up. Our physician Luke, uh, here in verse 39, uh, places him as a physician might take a position, standing over her. And then Jesus rebuked the fever in the same way, uh, apparently, he had rebuked the demon. That doesn't mean that there was yet another demon behind this fever, only that both of these miracles were wrought by the powerful word of Jesus. The fever was no more able to withstand the might of Christ's command than the demon had been. And the effect of it was instantaneous and complete uh, evidence by Luke's remark in verse 39 that she immediately got up and waited on them. The effect of Jesus' word was to enable and equip her, we might say, to go forth and serve. And there's a little lesson in there I don't want to pass over, but she becomes an example for us of what the Lord's purposes are for us when he brings his healing power into our own lives, when he answers our prayers and, and graciously gives us what we have prayed for. We're to use answered prayers for his service, for his people as testimonies to the reality of his word. They must not be an end to themselves, as unfortunately they often are, but instead an invitation to ensure that the Lord gets a return on his merciful investment in our lives.
And so the rhythm of a Sabbath afternoon uh, returned as family and friends rested and talked of the day's events. And the sun dipped in the sky, signaling the end of the Sabbath. But then uh, the city uh, suddenly came uh, back to life in what the commentator Walter Liefeld called one of the most beautiful scenes in scripture. That caught my eye when I was studying. One of the most beautiful scenes in scripture. And I agree. Uh, news had spread of the demon-possessed man and likely already of the healing of Peter's mother-in-law. Uh, there were many suffering souls in the city of Capernaum and, and friends and, and loved ones who sympathized with them and, and cared for them. And now as soon as Sabbath ended, they began making their way to the door of their house, a, a continual parade of people arriving at their front porch. Luke describes them in verse 40, look there, all those who had any who were sick with various diseases brought them to him and laying his hands on each one of them, he was healing them. Demons also were coming out of many shouting, you are the son of God, but rebuking them. He would not allow them to speak because they knew him to be the Christ. They knew him to be the Christ, the Christ. That last note from Luke about Jesus' concern that the demons knew he was the Christ, knew he was the promised Messiah to come, reflects the internal time clock that often guided Jesus' actions. The hour has not yet come, remember. He would often uh, express it that way. There was to be an end to his earthly ministry. There's, there's, there is an end to our earthly ministry. Every one of them, we don't know when the day is coming. Not sure we want to know, uh, but there will be an end. But there was a, a, a wonderful end to the Lord's earthly ministry, and he knew the significance of it. But it had to come, it must come at the appointed time. It was not for the demons to announce his true identity, and he would not allow it. Uh, neither did he desire that the people take up the banner of his messiahship with, with a false understanding and start a movement to make him an earthly kingdom, an earthly king. His kingdom was not of this world. And yet he was in the world, and now faced with the multitude of miseries uh, surrounding him, he was moved with compassion. And as each suffering soul was brought to him, he reached out and touched them and, and healed them. One by one they came, an endless stream of people coming to the house. Mark's account captures the moment. The whole city gathered at the door. And then day came, that's the simple note uh, Luke gives in verse 42. How late into the night before uh, all these healings had occurred, uh, he doesn't say, but uh, Mark, uh, again, adds some color to the account that in the early morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house and went away to a secluded place and was praying there. A posture we find him in repeatedly in the gospels. But the crowds, these excited crowds could not be held back while Luke records in verse 42 that the, the crowds were searching for him and came to him and tried to keep him from going away from them, Mark reveals that it was Peter and his companions who first found him and said to him, you know the line, everyone is looking for you. 
They had got caught up in the sensation of Jesus. They sensed there were great things ahead for Jesus and for them. He was a miracle worker with a gift of, of teaching that brought in great crowds, and, and this was an opportunity not to be ignored. Uh, this would become a pattern. Uh, it would persist for, for some time. Jesus would perform miracles of healing. He would turn loaves and, and bread into enough food to, to feed thousands of people, and, and the crowds would flock to him for all the wrong reasons. But now Jesus' response had to have disappointed them. Uh, they surely thought it strange. He had not, turns out Jesus had not arisen, uh, you know, energized by his uh, sudden fame. We're all working people in here, and when things go good in our work, we get energized uh, by it. We're going to we're going to slay the dragon. We, we get up and we head to work. Jesus had not done that. He uh, instead uh, said to them, verse 43, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also, for I was sent for this purpose. Here is the divine imperative. I want you to notice the divine imperative conveyed to earthbound would-be firebrands of a scintillating religious movement. No. No. You have misread everything you've witnessed. My father has an overarching purpose for me and I must carry it out. I must go far and wide while I am here and preach the good news of the kingdom of God. No mere human could speak the way Jesus did of his having been sent. No mere human, not me, not you, could speak in the way Jesus spoke of his having been sent by God for such an important mission, just as he often spoke of his having come into the world. So his being sent was a further indication his life was one that would be lived under divine authority. Hidden here, uh, hidden in our English translation of his words is that his duty to preach the kingdom of God is more literally preach the good news of the kingdom of God. The good news did not consist merely of, of healing and the casting out of demons. Jesus performed those miraculous works for sure. As he went about teaching and preaching, he encountered real people with real problems. He felt compassion for them and he healed them. But that was not the reason, the primary reason he had come. Those were signs of his coming, but they were not the primary reason he had come. In Mark's account, Jesus uh, phrases it, this is what I came for. That's what he says, this is what I came for. He came to proclaim in word and deed the absolute sovereignty of God and of him as his appointed servant to accomplish what was necessary to bring that kingdom into reality in the hearts of his chosen and eventually to finish the work by establishing it in a literal earthly kingdom. The thing for us to remember today is that Jesus did not come to earth 2,000 years ago primarily to be a miracle worker. He came, as we see throughout the Gospels, in order to die, in order to offer himself as a, a sacrifice for sins. And as we observe him conducting his ministry, his primary goal is to make that fact known. At first, some, somewhat cryptically and in parable, uh, later more clearly and explicitly. So, he appears to these excited disciples less interested 
in the popular acclaim of people who now seek after him because of what they might get out of him than in what no doubt seems to them to be the relatively mundane exercise of now going to other villages to preach. Having seen the miracles, the, the preaching had lost some of its allure. Uh, but that's what the Lord continued uh, to pursue. That's the significance of the closing verse. He kept on preaching in the synagogues of Judea. But we need to close. The most impressive display of Jesus' power was the authority with, his, with which he brought to the people the good news of the kingdom of God. At the end, when the risen Lord, the risen Lord, gathered his disciples together to give to them the great commission. Matthew chapter 28 is going to give them the great commission. He began by reinforcing that. He said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. And when we proclaim the gospel, we have that authority. We have his authority as our resource. When we set Christ before people, we're offering them the kingdom of God, offering to them the good news that Christ is king and those who belong to him are members of that kingdom and will spend eternity as the willing subjects, living kingdom lives, not wasting uh, the victories God is so consistently and bountifully giving to us, nor the answered prayers he so graciously provides, but gaining strength from them to live as his grateful subjects. Well, let's pray. Father, thank you for coming to earth the way you did in the person of your son. Thank you, Father, for uh, giving him such authority that he could accomplish your will. And thank you, Lord, for giving us uh, access to that authority through him and by your spirit. And Father, may we not uh, waste your grace and mercy to us, but give you a return on that as we navigate our lives and encounter various uh, trials and, and burdens and difficulties, sufferings and oppressions, and you hear our prayers and you give relief uh, when you answer our prayers, uh, Lord, may we go, as we've been emphasizing here for some time, with grateful hearts to give a return back to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.